In this lecture, we will focus on spatial and temporal terrain analysis. First, we will briefly mention summary parameters such as volumes and surface areas. Then, we will devote some time to first and second order point parameters that describe the terrain geometry, and we will talk about methods for slope aspect and curvatures using polynomial and spline approximation. Then we will discuss computing parameters from noisy data and how to combine topographic parameters to map landforms and terrain features. Finally, in the last section, we will talk about raster time series analysis using time series of LiDAR data. So what kind of terrain surface parameters we have? The terrain, terrain surface parameters are used to quantify terrain surface properties. They are derived from discrete representation of bivariate function that is a mathematical model of the topography. And we can distinguish several types of parameters. First, there are summary parameters that quantify property for entire surface uh, in a global, as a global parameter or for its subregion as a zonal parameter. And these type of parameters are volume, surface area, we can also compute fractal dimension or roughness. Then point geometry parameters quantify geometry at each point of the surface. And the parameters that belong to this, uh, under this type, are slope, aspect, and different types of curvatures. And then finally, we have cumulative flow parameters, and uh, we will describe these in the next lecture. So let's look at volume. Computation uh, of volume in GIS is rather simple. It can be applied as a global parameter or zonal parameter and the computation of volume is essentially a computation of integral which is approximated as sum of cuboids. So essentially what we are doing we need to multiply dx, dy and dz and because dx and dy are essentially constant over the entire area and they are uh, grid cell, they define grid cell area so that's resolution in the x direction and resolution in the y direction the only thing that we need to compute is actually sum of the z values and the, we usually restrict the z values, uh, z values by some uh, by some z zero elevation. So essentially, what we are computing, we are computing a cell value difference. And this z zero can be a constant, or it can be a plane or a curved surface. So essentially, volume can be computed as sum of grid cell values elevations multiplied by cell size and the accuracy will depend on the resolution and you can refine the accuracy by reinterpolating the surface of course the ultimate uh, uh, accuracy is really dependent on the accuracy of your data surface area is another parameter that can be applied as global or zonal and it is usually computed as a sum of three-dimensional triangle areas. So what you can do, you can take the raster and then you can divide it into triangles. And then you compute the areas of these triangles and sum uh, of these areas. And the actual surface area will depend on the direction of the diagonal. So we eventually you will end up with minimum and maximum surface. So there will be a difference based on how you create these triangles on the surface. 
triangles. And you can create these triangles either as diagonals of the grid cell or as eight triangles connecting grid cell center with neighboring ones. And again, the accuracy is dependent on the resolution and accuracy of your input data. And you can look, I have included the here few links uh, that discuss the computation of surface area in greater detail. Now let's look at point topographic parameters that measure geometric properties of the elevation surface at any point. And the basic parameters are steepness or steepest slope angle, orientation of topographic surface or aspect angle, and then shape of topographic surface is measured by curvatures in different directions. And the derivation or computation of these parameters is based on differential geometry. So, for the surface that is represented by continuous bivariate function that we have already described, we can compute gradient. And the gradient is a vector that has the coordinates defined as a difference in elevation in x direction and difference in elevation in y direction. And we will uh, use fx, fy as symbols for gradient vector. And this change in z in the x direction and y direction can be computed as first order partial derivatives of the function fxy that is used as mathematical model of the terrain surface. And gradient is a vector field that represents the maximum rate of change in elevation. And it will point upslope in the direction of steepest slope. So this is how gradient looks like. So again, it is a vector and it points, this vector points in the steepest slope direction. Slope angle is a function of gradient magnitude. That means that we compute a length, length of the vector defined by the gradient as the squared difference in the x direction plus square difference in y direction. And that defines tangent of the slope angle gamma. Very often we use slope in percent. So what is slope? It is angle between a horizontal plane and tangent to the surface. It measures maximum rate of change in elevation. And it is an important parameter because it controls flow velocity. So if our elevation map looks like this, so the brown is higher elevation, green is lower elevation, then the slope map will look like this. And you can see here it is expressed in degrees so aspect. Aspect angle is a function of gradient direction. So we express it as an angle in degrees and we compute it as Fy divided by Fx. And as I already said, uh, the gradient vector points into in steepest slope direction and it controls the direction of flow. It also is used to measure hill slope orientation. And you need to remember that we divide here by fx. And if fx is equal to zero, tangents will be infinity and the orientation is not defined. That means that in flat areas where the slope is zero, the aspect angle is undefined. 
and just a practical note that actual values of aspect are often rotated with zero degree north, but you always need to check the implementation, sometimes the zero points to east. So we said that using the gradient, we can compute slope angle and aspect angle as gradient magnitude and direction. But we can also compute slope or change in any direction of topography, not only in the steepest slope direction. And that is given by so-called directional derivative. So here is an example of map of slope and aspect. This is computed for terrain. So we have bare earth, vegetation and buildings on it. And it has been computed from one meter resolution digital surface model. So you can see that for bare earth, the slope angle is at maximum around 15 degrees. Then once we get to the edges of the forest and edges of the buildings, it goes all the way to 80 degrees 90 degrees uh, walls would be uh, difficult or impossible to model when we use raster representation and we have already discussed why because uh, we are representing the topography as bivariate function and we can't have two z values for uh, for one uh, location x y and here is the here is the aspect expressed uh, using the uh, using the angle. Here is another example of slope and aspect based on 10 meter resolution DEM. Both of these examples are from the assignments from uh, our data set and here you can see that the LiDAR data provide really a great level of detail and you can also observe, observe that along the streams and along the lakes we have much steeper slopes on the southern side of these lakes and, uh, uh, and streams than on the northern sides and that's uh, controlled by ge local geology. And here is the aspect map here with the color uh, with a gray shade color table. Now, what you need to be aware is uh, of uh, is the impact of integer digital elevation models on computing slope and aspect. Currently, we mostly work with floating point digital elevation. Uh, model representation so there usually isn't any problem but sometimes you you may be working with integer DEMs so for example here is a slope map uh, derived from a floating point digital elevation model that has vertical precision at millimeter level and uh, we already uh, looked at the at the histogram so he, here is the slope histogram and here is the aspect histogram for this digital elevation model now if this digital elevation model is distributed as integer dm that means that its uh, elevation will be cut at one meter sometimes you have integer dms at one foot vertical resolution and that has a pretty profound impact on slope and aspect. So you can see that what we are getting here, we are getting bias towards certain elevations in the, in the uh, slope histogram. And it is even more visible in the aspect histogram, where it is really just bi biased in the eight uh, cardinal directions. And the result of the map is that you, you, you see this contour-like uh, contour uh, pattern and what is happening, you have steps uh, in the digital elevation model. So here we have 
zero slope and then we have a very steep slope and again zero slope very steep slope and when you look at this road here this road goes smoothly over this bridge so we have some slope here because it goes up and down however when it is represented as integer it's as if you were driving on steps so you really have zero slope and then steeper slope zero slope you have one meter steps on this uh, on this highway so you don't really want to be driving or any on anything like that and i'm talking about this because this also influence for example flow routing there will be no flow uh, no flow direction no um, slope in this area so there will be no flow movement in this area and same over these little steps on the road so water will be standing for example here so you need to be aware of when you are working with the integer dm it is usually good to sample the dm and reinterpolate it to floating point to create a smooth surface so how do we compute slope and aspect in gis so we already explained that Computation of slope and aspect involves estimating partial derivatives, but the DEM is not represented by, an, uh, by a function, but by its discretization as a raster. So, so there are many ways how to compute from these discrete data these partial derivatives. Uh, the simplest approach is the steepest elevation difference. And this is an approach that is uh, used in D8 routing that we will be talking about, but it's rather inaccurate. So most of the GIS systems and most of the software where slope is computed is using polynomial approximation on 3 per 3 neighborhood of each cell. And we will explain how, how that is done. And they're uh, using a second order polynomial as an approximation function. And then another way how to do it is spline approximation on raster or directly from point data. So you can compute these first order partial derivatives simultaneously with interpolation. So here is an example of estimating partial derivatives using polynomial approximation. So the polynomial function will be this second order polynomial. And there are different types of these polynomials that are used. This one is most common and one of the most accurate actually. And then we want to uh, use this to compute uh, the partial derivatives in this point. So what you do, you fit this polynomial to the nine grid points and we need to find only five parameters to compute this polynomial actually six and uh, so we have more points than we need the parameters so we use weighted least squares and you can actually do it analytically and you end up with these equations for partial derivative in x direction and partial derivative in y direction so it all looks sound, sounds complicated but it's actually very simple because when you look at this what you are computing here you are essentially computing for example for fx you compute the difference between these two elevations then you take twice the difference between these elevations and one time this difference and you compute a weighted average and you get the fx and the same for fy in the y direction and the uh, the result does not pass exactly through this point and it has a smoothing effect and you can look at the code for our slope aspect and I will show you during the assignment how to look it up how this is computed how this is implemented in GIS and in the next section we will talk about curvatures